And if you don't know, if you're new, welcome, but we are a Bible teaching church. I don't know if you know that about us. Hopefully you do, but we hold to the Word of God and we teach the Bible. And, you know, as one of my favorite pastors used to say, we don't have sermonettes for Christianettes, okay? Um, we go through the Word of God. And I just warn you because, look, we're going to feed you after, but the, the passage today, we're going to cover 27 verses before you get all upset. It's, it's a way for you to apply what we're learning because Jesus is going to teach for hours in this passage and then he's going to feed the 5,000. So we're going to go for hours today and then we're going to have a potluck. The food will be cold, but don't worry about it. <laughs> It'll be fine. So um, if you would, though, get your Bibles ready to Mark chapter 6, and I'm going to attempt to finish this chapter today. We're going to finish it, Lord willing. But two weeks ago, we, we looked at um, Jesus sending out his 12 disciples on their first missionary journey. And I think that was a pretty neat thing that he was, he was sending them out for the first time. He gave them gifts, the power to heal the sick, to cast out demons, and to preach repentance. Oh, did I forget seat cushions if you need a seat cushion? See, sometimes I forget that. So if you need a seat cushion, raise your hand. We have seat cushions. Um, in any case, so he sends them out, and we looked at uh, all of these men they had been learning. These disciples had been learning so many lessons from Jesus that, like you today, have to apply to your own lives, they were learning all of these lessons. And then last week we looked at the fact that there was this narrative placed in the middle of uh, Mark chapter 6 um, that John the Baptist was beheaded. He was killed. And we went, I won't go back into the whole thing. Remember it was, it was this wicked line of, of this wicked family, you know, whose family tree didn't really branch. <laughs> Remember, I won't go into all that, but um, this wicked line of Herod's these evil people, and we saw that they beheaded John. But I told you that was for a purpose, and I believe it was placed into Mark chapter 6 for a purpose because it was right after Jesus sent out his disciples. And I talked about how John even said he had to decrease for Jesus to increase. And the other thing about that, and, and I didn't mention it, I don't think, but, you know, John's mission on earth was done. And so the Lord took him home. And I want to just remind you, the same is, is true for you and me. You know, if you're still here, if you're still breathing, most of you are, right? If you're still breathing, God still has a purpose for you and for me. You're not done yet. Do you realize that? If you're still around, you're not done yet. God still has a purpose for you and a plan. Now you have to get on with that plan. And we're going to talk about that today. But the same is also true in that we have to decrease for Jesus to increase in our lives. And that's what we saw in Mark chapter 6 last week with John the Baptist. That's why that narrative was placed in the middle of this chapter. But now today we're going to see phase 2 of the discipleship training. We're going to see phase 2 where the disciples return from this missionary journey. And they're going to report to Jesus about everything that they saw. And what we're going to see is these disciples go from what are called disciples, which we all are, to the first use of the word apostles. They transition from disciples to apostles. And this is something each one of us need to do as well. Because there's nothing worse than a bunch of Christians who get stuck in just being disciples. Apostolos, the ones that are sent out, the ones who do the work of the ministry, the ones who serve others, the ones who serve the Lord. We are to be apostles. We're not just to be disciples. If you're stuck in your rut and you're just stuck in being a disciple, you will cause problems, just so you know. And if you're causing problems, this might be your issue. So pay attention. Take notes. Or at least mental notes, you know. And, and before you, you know, get too offended, understand I think all of us have been there in our lives, in our Christian walk. But there's going to be this transition. And so with that, Mark chapter 6, verse 30. I'll just read through verse 32 and then we'll dive in. Mark chapter 6, starting at verse 30. Then the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all things both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said to them, Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. So they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. And Father, this is your word. And Lord, we pray right now in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is the Word made flesh. We pray that you will pour out your Spirit upon this service, upon each one of us here today that you will allow your word to sink deep into our hearts and to change us from the inside out. We love you, and we thank you, and we honor you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so now these disciples, 
They have transitioned to apostles. And I can't even say that term anymore these days, right? But this is a good transition. This is a godly transition. To transition from disciples to apostles. And we see that they, this happened because they were sent out. They were sent out on their first missionary journey. And then they come back. And I just think about this and, and picture this in your mind. They come back and they sit with Jesus. And they're telling him all the things that they saw and did. Isn't that, I mean, just picture it. You can imagine these guys were excited. They just healed the sick. They'd cast out demons because Jesus gifted them with those powers, with those, those spiritual gifts. They've been preaching repentance, and they saw many repent. And they're probably sitting around the fire talking to Jesus, and he's probably smiling. Could you just see it? Do you know the Lord loves to hear from us, just like these apostles, these disciples? You know, he wants to hear from us. He wants you to talk to, you, to him about your day and about the things that you see in life. And have you, ever, have you ever gone out and done ministry, done something really amazing, and you saw amazing results, and then you just couldn't wait to tell people about it? That's the heart we need to have with our Lord. He wants to hear from you. And sometimes you've got to get alone to a deserted place. Don't you know that? And the deserted place, by the way, can be your own home if you just turn off the, the TV and the Internet and the dumb phone, you know, the stupid phones that we call smartphones. If you turn those off and just get alone with God, it's a wonderful thing. And sometimes we need to get alone together with our spouse and the Lord just to study and pray or our kids just as a household. Those are good things. You know, I was reminded painfully this week, you know, um, <laughs> you know, sometimes I, this flesh, I, I just, I can't wait for that brand new body. First of all, I already told you guys, I'm going to be nine feet tall. That's a short man's dream. So those that are first shall be last. Those that are last shall be first. But, you know, last week I, I burned my eye. I thought it was allergies or something. I burned my eye because I was grinding some metal and stuff on Saturday. And I thought it was just allergies, but it was a, like a welding burn. And my eye got really bad. And then Monday, I wake up in the middle of the night, Sunday night, Monday with a fever, and I got sick, and I was sick, and I was on my back for a few days. And it's very humbling, and I don't mind telling you this, because whenever God teaches me a lesson, he kind of makes me tell him myself. So, you know, it was one of those things where sometimes when we won't get alone with God, when we won't just spend more time with him, when we're just busy with everything else, <laughs> he knows what's best for us, doesn't he? You know, the thing about being so weak and when you're sick, it's like fasting. You know, you become weak and you, you start to rely on him and you start to realize just how weak you really are. But I have to tell you, it was a wonderful time of just spending time alone with the Lord. And as he does, he often winks at me in those situations. And he had a couple guys early on in the week, not even in our congregation, just get a hold of me and say, hey, the Lord put me on your, uh, put you on my heart. Are you doing okay? You know, what's going on? And I told them, and they're like praying for me, and I got to pray for them. But it was kind of one of these winks from God, because I was just spending time in prayer, seeking the Lord about everything. And when you get alone with him, when you just seek him with your whole heart, beautiful things happen. But I think sometimes we get so busy, or we get so, it's so easily distracted by TV and other things, just things that are so easy to get distracted with, that we forget just to get alone with God. Slow down. And get alone together sometimes with your family. It's a good thing. And so we, hear, we see here that Jesus, he tells his disciples that it's needed. They need to get away. Because he understands they're being inundated now too. Because they've been performing miracles. They've been preaching. And now people are inundating them as well. So much that Jesus said, or the passage tells us here that they weren't even able to eat. And so he says, you know, we need to get alone. We need to go to a deserted place. And so this is what happens. Now, the other thing about that is... When we spend time with the Lord and when we seek him out, one of the things that people often, you know, they'll come to me and they'll say, hey, I'm trying to seek the will of God for my life. What's the will of God for my life? And I tell them, you won't know unless you spend time with the Lord. You know, prayer, that's part of what prayer is, is aligning your will with his. It's not bending him and getting him to, to bend to your will and say, hey, I'll give you your laundry list of, of needs. Prayer and time with the Lord is to make sure you're in his will. And that's the only way you're going to know if you're in his will. Also, test it with the word of God. You know, in the Garden of Eden, we make it really complicated too, but in the Garden of Eden, remember what God told Adam and Eve? He said, you can eat from any tree you want, just don't eat from this one. Sin. And many times we make the will of God complicated. There are many choices, many times. If it glorifies God, if it lines up with scripture, you know, so don't, 
be so consumed that it has to be this pinpoint. Now, when it is, God will show you. Okay? But only, you're only going to know if you spend time with him and you get alone with him. But then look at this. Look at verse 30, 40, or I should say 33. The multitudes saw them departing, and many knew him and ran there on foot from all the cities. They arrived before them and came together to him. So this is what's going on. So Jesus and the disciples, his now apostles, they're going to get alone. They're going to go to this deserted place. But the people know Jesus so well and oh, that this would be us. <laughs> they know Jesus so well. They know his patterns. They know where he goes. So this multitude, and I want you to understand, when we think about a multitude, we think like, you know, like a group like this. You know, you got like 100 people, you know, going after Jesus. That, get that out of your mind. Do you understand the multitude here is probably close to 20,000 people? And we'll come back to that. But they knew him, so they ran on foot and arrived before Jesus and his apostles got there in boat. And you need to understand this. They're going over four miles. This is a four-mile journey in the boat, in this 27-foot eight by 8-foot fishing vessel. They're going to go four miles. And before you think, oh, they just, these people just ran over a few hundred yards, it was eight miles on land. Eight miles. I just want you to picture this because I think there's a valuable message in this. Jesus and his apostles are going to go four miles in a boat to a secluded, secluded place to get alone. But these people are so desperate for Jesus. They're so hungry for him, for his teaching, for his healing, for his touch, that they run 20,000 people, they run eight miles. Just think about that. Most of us would probably die if we ran eight miles, you know. But I'm just speaking for myself. I'm old and out of shape. But here's the thing. I just want to ask a question to each one of us today. What do you run to? You know, what motivates you? What motivates you and what do you run to? You know, some of us guys, we have hobbies. We have all these hobbies. We'll go hunt. We'll get up 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning. We'll go out. We'll pack everything up. We'll, we'll spend days analyzing maps. We'll do all this stuff, and we'll run to hunting. Man, we'll spend our time, our energy, our money, our effort. We'll go out there. Some of you ladies, it, don't get all, you know, I see some of you getting a little high, you know, on your, on your little um, horse there. But what about you ladies? And I don't want to be stereotypical or nothing, but you know, Black Friday is a crazy time. And, I, and it's not as bad as it used to be, but I've seen ladies, they, they save up, they get everything ready, they map out the stores they're gonna to go to, they get the traffic, they do all this stuff. And then they'll spend all night shopping till they drop, you know, that type of thing. It doesn't matter, man or woman. And by the way, there, there are two sexes. That's, we're one of those churches that believe in the Bible. There is man and there is woman. There is, that's it. And here's the thing. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. All of us have hobbies and we all have interests. We all have things we run to. Football games, basketball games, it doesn't matter. Shopping, it doesn't matter. What do you run to, though? Oh, that we would be those who would run eight miles to be with Jesus. You know, I just, this is one of those things that I think just sit on that for a while. Just ponder that. What is it that you run to? What is it that we run to? But you know, I love this. Because I love Jesus' response. His response is not my, what my response would be. <laughs> you know, I think about this. and You know, Jesus is trying to get alone. He's trying to get some rest for himself, for his apostles. He's trying to get alone and just have some quiet time. And 20,000 people show up and ruin it. <laughs> and me... I'll just share. I would be like, oh, I would probably sigh. I'd be frustrated. Uh, you know, as someone who's more introverted, sometimes I got to recharge, right? Well, Jesus isn't frustrated. He isn't upset. He isn't angry. I love his response. Look at verse 34. And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. Oh, that we would be like Jesus. <laughs> you know, this, this really gets me because how many times are we annoyed with people in life and ministry? How many times, you know, are we bothered by things of God? You know, because we have plans and we don't like when they're interrupted. But, you know, it's a weird saying, but, you know, this word for compassion in the Greek, it means to yearn, yearn in the bowels. Now, it gets a little weird because in English in our modern times, it means a little something different, right? 
<laughs> you know, to move in the bowels. That's technically what it's, <laughs> it's talking about. But it's not the modern version of that. Just so you know, I heard one pastor talking about that and I laughed hysterically. But no, you know that gut feeling? You know when you're really scared or you're really nervous or something happens or you're really just hurting? You know, we always say, oh, my heart was hurting. But really, it's deeper than that. And that's what this word is. See, Jesus wasn't just moved a little bit. He was deeply moved at his very core. He wasn't annoyed. He was moved with compassion because these people were like sheep without a shepherd. And he's the good shepherd. And he knows what a good shepherd should do. And you know, in our world today, how many people do we see running around like sheep without a shepherd? You know, and they're searching for anything they can to fulfill their lives. And we look around and we see them, they're running everywhere and, you know, they're, they're jumping into all these worldly ideas and man's philosophies and worthless ideals. All these political arenas and all these godless political ramblings and secular reasoning and secular humanism, and all of these things, people are just running and they, they're seeking after and they don't even realize they're sheep without a shepherd. They need a shepherd. And you know, we're to be that for them. We're, what does a shepherd do? He gives them food. The gospel is food. The word of God is food. We have to be those who will be willing to reach them, even if they don't want to hear the message, even if they don't want to be shepherded. We have to step out. We have to do what we're called to do. Remember this, you know, the gospel is actually, and this might be groundbreaking for some of you, but the gospel itself is a message of words. Did you know that? People, have you ever heard this? You, you know, some of you already know, this is one of my pet peeves. Have you ever heard it said, people say, preach the gospel and when necessary, use words. Guys, if you say that, stop. Because do you understand? The gospel is words. It's a message. It's the message of the cross. Of what Jesus Christ did for you and me. That he took every sin upon himself that we have ever committed or ever will commit on the cross of Golgotha, of Calvary. It's a message of words. You can't give that message by being nice to people. Understand this. Charity and all that stuff, that is wonderful. Feeding people, clothing people, helping people, charitable deeds. That's wonderful. But if that's all you ever do, all you've done is make a person's journey to hell a little more comfortable. Huh, ouch. <laughs> well, stop. Yeah, your life needs to line up. It must. But open your mouth. You have no problem opening your mouth in many other realms and reasons, right? Um, am I stepping on anybody's toes or is it just me again? You know, open your mouth and tell people about Jesus. Don't just be nice to them or kind to them. Tell them why you're kind. Tell them who you used to be. Give them your testimony. It doesn't have to be complicated. I told you before. Here's the greatest evangelism tool I've ever used. Ready? Uh, and you're, some of you already know, but take notes. This is it. This is the greatest evangelism tool I've ever used. Ready? Hi. Start a conversation. You know, if you're so nervous about sharing your faith, I call it jiggling doorknobs. Just say hi to somebody. Be nice to them. Be a little more personable. You know, it's hard for an introvert to be a little more personable. People think, you know, you're angry because you're walking around with that look on your face, but you're just thinking. And, you know, so you force yourself to be a little more personable, even if you love people. But that's what you have to do. Get yourself out of your comfort zone. Just say hi. And then share the gospel. It's words. And not only that, we're told to make disciples. Guess how you make disciples? Oh, you just live it out. No. You disciple them through the word of God. Do you understand? That's a big part of discipleship is the word of God, to teach them the word so that they can learn to apply it. Now you must, again, walk it out and show them how to apply it, like I'm showing you today with two-hour sermon. But here's the thing. We must teach. That's part of discipleship. That's part of phase one. You know, and then you become phase two, an apostle. But I'll go back into that later. But here's the thing. We know that the word of God will not return void. Your words, don't give them your words, your platitudes and all your little comments. Give them God's word. I mean, share the truth of God in your own life, but give them God's word because it won't return void. And the other thing about that is I've seen this mistake in ministry many times. Remember, Jesus was a good shepherd. We're to be that in a sense. And shepherds lead sheep. They don't drive them like cattle. 
And I've seen many people in ministry make the mistake of trying to drive people like cattle. It's a lot of work, number one. And number two, you just offend and make people mad. You know those people who, you know, the tryhards that will just continually call people up. Hey, you come to church, you come to church, you come to church. Hey, it's like that little dog. Remember the cartoon? Hey, Spike, you want to chase a cat, Spike? You remember? I'm, some of you young people, I, I get it, you won't know. But, and then he would just smack the little dog, you know, and stuff. And you probably couldn't even make those kind of cartoons these days. But the thing is, is don't, don't push people continue. You know, I don't believe in traditional follow-up ministry because the Holy Spirit follows up. You know, when I was ready to change, you didn't have to beg me to come to church. When I was ready to live for the Lord, I was in the Word, and I was ready. But until then, it causes a lot of time and effort to be wasted when that person is not ready. So you pray for them, and you lead them, you teach them, and you allow them to follow when they're ready. Keep praying for them, though. Don't stop praying. But then we see Jesus, like I was telling you in the introduction, that was a, quite a while ago anyway, but Jesus is teaching for hours. And, he, and it rolls on here, and we see this in, in Mark 6, verse 35 and 36. It says, When the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and already the hour is late. Send them away, that they may go into the surrounding country and villages buy, and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. And so the disciples, these apostles, they see this real-world problem, right? They see this real-world problem, and they think that it needs a physical solution. See, their eyes are still focused on the physical, on the tangible, on the things they can see. They don't realize that all things, but Jesus is about to teach them and us that all things have a spiritual context. All things. Do you understand that? This life is temporary. This world is temporary. It's all going to burn. This is temporary. It's temporal. It's all going to burn. We're going to be with Jesus, though, forever. The eternal and the spiritual, that is real. And you have to make this adjustment. We have to make this adjustment. Jesus is about to show his disciples they need to make this adjustment. And the adjustment is simple. We need to look at the world through spiritual eyes, through spiritual glasses. We're not to look at spiritual things through physical eyes or the physical glasses of our flesh. All things are spiritual first and foremost, regardless of what people will teach you or tell you. And so Jesus tells these guys in verse 37, he gives them this test, but he's showing them, look beyond your circumstances, look beyond the physical realm, look at this, verse 37, but he answered and said to them, you give them something to eat. <laughs> and they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? So again, Jesus is taking them into phase two. He's taking them into the next phase of ministry. Could you imagine these guys, though? They just got back. They're probably pretty, you know, thinking pretty good about themselves. They just got back from this missionary journey. They got back, and they're telling Jesus all about what they did, and they're probably thinking they got things figured out. But Jesus senses something. He senses something in them, and sometimes he senses it in us. Maybe even right now. <laughs> but he senses something in them. And this is what I love, because... He's challenging them in ways that break them out of their comfort zone. And they're probably thinking, you know, what's he talking about? You know, how are we going to feed these people? You know, I, I know this. In my own Christian walk, um, going back, it was quite a while ago, I'll be honest, but I thought I had things figured out. I won't tell you all the embarrassing stories of, oh, I was such an idiot. But here's the thing. I really thought I had figured things out. I thought I was so mature as a Christian. I knew the Bible. I'd been serving in ministry. But it was really about me. And I really, probably like these apostles, I just thought I had everything figured out. And I was just going to go forward in ministry. And then God took me into phase two. <laughs> Have you ever been there? He broke me. But then he didn't leave me as an orphan. He broke me and showed me my own pride. And then he did something that shifted my paradigm. Burst my bubble. Think of anything you want to come up with. And it was called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Oh, wait. <laughs> We're one of those churches. Yeah, we are. And if you're not, it's okay. Maybe we can get you there. But here's the thing. God did that in my life, and it changed everything. When he baptized me with the Holy Spirit of God, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, when he gave that gift to me, 
My entire life changed. I got a brand new pair of glasses and nothing has ever been the same and I'm not exaggerating. It has never been the same and I've never looked at the world the same and I've never looked at people, I've never looked at anything the same. When he baptized me with the Holy Spirit, when that happened, it was so radical in my life. It turned me upside down and that's exactly what I needed. And I have to tell you, and I, I'm, I'm telling you this for a reason. You know, over the years I've seen many people in ministry, it's usually easy, easy to spot them too, who will do physical things in hopes that they will have spiritual effects. I've seen it over and over in my own life, where they'll see physical things, they'll do physical things, hoping that it'll have a spiritual effect. When we need to do the opposite, we need to do spiritual things knowing that they'll have a physical effect. Does that make sense? But during Thanksgiving week, I just want to prepare you guys because I want to teach on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to teach on the spiritual gifts. And here's the thing. I want you to begin to pray now. If you're someone who's never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you're not a second-class Christian, by the way. It's just an, another gift from God. And it's something to go into the apostleship. It's something when you're ready to go to phase two, God will give this to you if you seek it out. And I'm going to teach on that. But I want you to begin to pray now. And for those of you who have already received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you know. And if you don't know if you've received it, you haven't. You just need to understand it's one of those things. But I've also seen people who won't admit they haven't received it. Because of their own pride and because of their own stature, you know, they, they won't admit it. They'll say, oh yeah, I've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And yet you don't see the fruit in their life. And you know it's not true. And your heart breaks for them. Like Jesus, you have so much compassion because you, you're thinking, stop it. I know you haven't received it, even though you say you have. There's so much more if you would just submit your life to Jesus wholly and completely. And their pride won't let them. They're stuck in, it, in that rut. But I would challenge each one of you, don't get stuck in your pride. And don't get worried about weirdness with the Holy Spirit. Do you trust God or don't you? Do you trust His Holy Spirit? then what do you have to worry? There are going to be abuses. I've seen them. You've seen them. You know, we've all seen the abuses. But you know what? That's okay. Those all get cleaned up. Don't get worried. Trust your king. Trust the Lord. Trust the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit will lead you. He will teach you. He will show you. He's your comforter. Paracletus, he comes alongside of us. He comes alongside of us to help us. He's inside of us, sorry, inside of us for salvation. But he can come upon us for his work, for his ministry. And so I just want you to begin to pray about it and test it with his word. Go seek it out even before we teach on this. This is something, though, that Jesus, he's doing this with his disciples in our passage. He's challenging them. He's bursting their bubbles. And, you know, again, they probably think they've arrived but then with one statement, he reveals their immaturity. <laughs> he tells them, you give them something to eat. We're talking about 20,000 people here. Imagine these 12 apostles standing there going, what do you mean? And I love it because verse 37 says, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? I love this because in this statement, it's sarcasm. And I am, as a short man, very fluent in sarcasm. I'm trying to get over it, but... Um, but that's what's going on here. They're like, oh, really? Because understand, 200 denarii. A denarii was an entire day's wages. 200 denarii is like two-thirds of a year's wages. So whatever that is, think about that. Think of the thousands of dollars that would be equivalent today. And they're like, oh, really? So you want us you know, to go away to a village and take thousands of dollars we don't have and go buy food? That's basically what they're saying. Because why? They're just looking at the natural. They're not even thinking, after all this time with Jesus, they're still thinking natural first and not spiritual. Do you understand? Do you understand that's what's going on? But Jesus, I love this, because even though they're saying that, and he knows what they're, how they're being and how they're acting, he himself, <laughs> he doesn't react, and he doesn't even respond to their question. I love this about Jesus. Verse 38, but he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said five and two fish. Now understand, these aren't big giant loaves 
like the ones Lisa makes, you know, we have that special occasion. These aren't giant loaves. These are little pita bread loaves, the little tiny ones, you know. So they have five of those and two fish. Ah, 20,000 people, Jesus. Could you imagine what they were thinking? Oh, man, but I love this. And you don't miss this, okay? Don't miss this. Because this is one of those things that will change your life in, in your Christian walk. Okay, don't miss this. <laughs> he just commands them to do something. He says, give me all you have. Whatever it is, just give me what you have. No matter the amount, just give me whatever you have. That's all he wants from you. Do you know that? That's it. Whatever you have. Don't worry about your talents and abilities. Don't worry about all those things. Don't worry about, every, you know, I'm not good enough to serve it. Stop. He doesn't care about your ability. He cares about your availability. He will take whatever you're willing to give him and multiply it beyond measure. You know, I can testify to that in my own life. You know, without going into my own testimony, I know. I've seen it. I've seen what God can do with a boy from the wrong side of the tracks. Trailer park trash. I've seen it. When you just say, you know what? Use me, Lord. Just give him whatever you have. It doesn't have to be much. 20,000 people and all they have is five little pita breads and two fish. Well, in the natural, that seems impossible, doesn't it? It is in the natural. But I also love this because in order to arrange something spiritual, Jesus gets organized. Do you know that God is a God of order? Do you understand this? Even when we talk about the gifts of the Spirit, and when, when the work of the gifts of the Spirit work through us, they are to be done. 1 Corinthians 14 tells us, verse 40, I believe it is, check me on that, decently and in order. Which means frying, you know, on the ground like bacon and sizzling and rolling around like we see on some of the so-called Christian TV. People convulsing and falling over and can't control themselves and all this other stuff. Come on, give me a break. Again, remember I told you that there will be abuses. But a true work of the Holy Spirit, he's a gentleman. And he does all things decently and in order. Now, that doesn't mean this. It doesn't mean you won't be uncomfortable. <laughs> Your flesh will be uncomfortable at times. When God broke me, I remember when I began to pray in tongues. I was so uncomfortable, and I didn't care. <laughs> it was the greatest uncomfort I'd ever experienced. And it was a beautiful thing because he broke my expectations. But he did it in his way. Perfect, decently and in order. And I love this because look at Mark 6, 39 through 41. When he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the green grass, so they sat down in ranks in hundreds and fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves, and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fish he divided among them all. Now it says they were sitting on the green grass. We know from another gospel, this is right around Passover time. So it's spring in Israel. And by the way, we're, we're trying to work out our trip. I think we've got a date. We're not going to go to Israel until 2024, but it'll be March of 2024. Right, Hugh? March of 2024. So you'll get to see the green grass. It's one of the most beautiful times to visit Israel just before Passover. In any case, it gives us time also to prepare and get, get things ready. And we're going to be partnering with some other churches on that too. So, But he gets them all together and he gets them organized. And I like what one pastor says, a, a symmetrical seating arrangement, possibly 50 semicircles of 100 people each with semicircles one behind the other in ranks. Such an arrangement was familiar to the Jews during the festivals and it made food distribution more convenient. And so these disciples are getting these 20,000 people ready for food. <laughs> and they know all they have is five little pita loaves and two fish. Could you imagine how uncomfortable they were in their flesh? <laughs> this isn't going to go well, Jesus. You know, imagine how embarrassed they might have been. Just put yourself in that position. But they get everyone ready because they do what they're told. This is another lesson. Even though they're probably skeptical and they were a little sarcastic and cynical, they do what they're told. When Jesus tells you to do something... You ought to, when Jesus tells you to do something, you ought to, mm, I like it. This is good. So I'll incorporate this into every service just to keep you guys awake. But here's the thing. That is such a great lesson. Sometimes he'll ask us to do things that are uncomfortable. Just do it. 
It was long before Nike, I promise. Just do it. Just do what Jesus asks. Because there is always, 100% of the time, there is always a payoff. And we see that payoff here in verse 42 with seven powerful words, if you have the New King James. It says, so they all ate and were filled. Huh. You know that word for filled? Thanksgiving's coming up, so you can relate. It's the same word that's related to gluttony or glutton, where you're so stuffed. I know nobody in here will do that today. When you're so stuffed, you're sick. You know, it's like it's just, you're full. That's what the word here means. Jesus took those five little loaves and two fish and just fed 20,000 people. And look at how he did it. He had the disciples distribute the food, the apostles. Notice, they're not eating yet. But he had them walk it out in faith. He's going to show them. He's working on them because they still don't get it. He says, okay, here, do this. Watch what happens. And I love this because look at verse 43. And they, speaking of the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles, they took up 12 baskets full of fragments and of the fish. How many apostles are there? There's 12. You didn't know you were going to have a math test today, too. How many baskets full? 12. What's Jesus showing them? When you serve the Lord, when you give him all you have, when you step out in faith and you just simply do what Jesus asks you to do, your basket's going to be full. Do you understand? They hadn't eaten all day, remember? The disciples? They wanted to send them away. They were probably hungry, you know? They hadn't eaten. We see in that context, they weren't eating. They were distributing the food. But now Jesus says, I have food for you too. Twelve baskets left over. Each disciple had a basket of food. And this is what I love. You know, the most miserable Christians I've ever been around are those who do things for self. And it's always about self. And I have to tell you, I speak from my own experience. Because when you do things for self, and you don't even realize it sometimes, when you're doing things for self, you always lack something. But when you're truly in his will and you're doing things for your king and you're serving those around you, your basket is always full. I can't explain it. If you know, you know. But it's true. And I just love this. And then you might say, well, what about Jesus? He hasn't eaten. Where's his basket? And this is what I love. Remember in John chapter 4, when Jesus was talking to the woman at the well? He preaches to her and then the disciples are worried about him and they come to him and say, hey, you're hungry, you need to eat something. And this is what Jesus said in John 4, verse 32 through 34. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? Again, these guys are just like us. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And then Jesus goes on to talk about the harvest and how that is what drives him. And this is the thing, you know, his food was spiritual in nature first before it was ever physical. Because everything Jesus did was spiritual in nature first. Over the physical, over the carnal. And when you think about what he had just done here in Mark chapter 6, that was quite a meal for Jesus, wasn't it? He shepherded these people who he had compassion, deep compassion for. He loved them so much. He taught his disciples, his apostles, this valuable lesson. He fed them all. After teaching them, after feeding them with the word, that's quite a meal for Jesus. And again, we know it was around 20,000 people, and here's why. Because it was around 5,000 men. And it's not a sexist comment, I'll explain. Verse 44, now those who had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men. And that's literally men. Now this, this is a reference to the head of the household. When families were considered the normal thing, the biblical model is one man, one woman, create a family. And the man was to be the head of the household because he represented what Christ is for the church. It's God's plan. That's God's plan. And so when they're numbering them here, they're numbering the men. This doesn't include the wives and all the children. And so scholars, most scholars agree, this was up to 20,000 people, roughly. You know, what's happened in our society now, though? They're tearing down everything that's godly, the godly foundations. They're tearing down everything that was declared in the book of Genesis. But it just tells us we're living in the days of Noah. 
you know? And the thing about that is, I hate to say this, but this world's only going to get worse. That's what the scripture says. So how much more are our spiritual glasses needed now than ever before? Don't walk in the flesh. Don't look around your physical, you know, abilities and physical circumstances. Get your eyes on your king, look eternal, and put on your spiritual glasses. Because things are changing in this world. But know this, like I said, they were filled there in verse 42. They were filled. But the Gospel of John tells us this. The crowd was still looking at the carnal too. They were, hey man, free buffet. Jesus is feeding us. You know what the men in John chapter 6, it says they wanted to do? They wanted to take Jesus, seize him, and make him king right then. It was all about politics for them. Oh, we got an election coming up. I better be careful. Here's the thing. Keep your priorities straight. Vote. Do whatever you're supposed to. Some people are called to run for office. Some people are called to serve in that way. Do whatever you're supposed to do and, and certainly vote. But keep your priorities straight. You know, here's the thing. Jesus, he told them, he, rebuked, he said, no, I'm, it's not my time. He took care of those guys. He sent them on their way. But they just wanted to seize him because all those people could do, those who had their bellies full, was think about the carnal. They wanted to make him king. Get rid of these pesky Romans, you know. Get rid of this administration. And they were missing the forest for the trees. Don't get off track. Know what your first priority is. All those other things, do what you're supposed to do, but know your priorities. But we've seen this before. Watch this. Jesus is going to then send his disciples out on a boat. He sends the crowd away, and he sends his disciples, those apostles, out on a boat. And this time he's not going with them, though. Remember last time they sent him out on a boat? He went with them. And he had to teach them a lesson. He had to teach them a spiritual lesson. And they learned that he was commander of all nature, that he could command the water and the waves and the wind, that in one uh, fell swoop, in one statement, he could make all of nature obey him. And you would think they had learned their lesson. They were now going to walk in the spiritual. <laughs> but they're not. And so he has to teach them a familiar lesson. And yet it's different. Look at verse 45. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida. Well, he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now uh, about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea, and would have passed them by. Understand, the wind came up and pushed them, it says, to the middle of the sea. So they're out there, and they're just doing everything they can, and they're alone, right, but together. But Jesus isn't in the boat this time. And so they can't go wake him up and yell at him. Remember how they did that? Are you gonna, you, you gonna let us drown out here, Jesus? You know? Now what are they gonna do? Oh, they're gonna take it into their own hands. They're gonna work in their own flesh and they start rowing with all their might. That's what they're gonna do here. And that's what any practical person does, right? Just gotta get the job done. But all they had to do, we notice here, Jesus saw them. It means he never kept his, he never took his eye off of them. All they would have had to do is what they'd done in the past, and that's cry out to him. He was just a call away. But no, they're going to row to their heart's content, and they're going to get exhausted doing this. And that's such a picture of us. But this is what I love. And also, this is so funny about Jesus. Did you notice this? It says he's walking on the water. He's walking on the water of the Sea of Galilee, and it says he's going to walk as though to walk by. <laughs> it's like he's just walking, whistling. <laughs> hey, guys. <laughs> I just love that. See, I get tickled by this stuff. But um, that's hilarious to me. But then we read in the, in the language what really is going on is that he's walking by because he wants to give them the choice. You know, Jesus does that for you and me in our situation. You know, he'll, he'll let you learn as much as you want to learn. As I often say, he'll make it as easy on you as you let him. You know, but he'll walk on by. He's a gentleman, but you have to ask him into your situation. You have to ask him into your life. That's who he is. But the desire there in the language is that he, that's what he wanted. He wanted his apostles to just call out to him. But this is what I love too. He kept them in his sight the whole time. And don't you know that's the same thing for you and me? Sometimes when we feel abandoned, 
by God, he's just got his eye on you. Just call out to him. And you know, many times in our own efforts, you know, the fourth watch is the last watch of the night. Do you understand? That's between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. He waited till the fourth watch. <laughs> Have you ever felt that way, you know, in your own life? Where you just finally get exhausted, it's the fourth watch, and then Jesus shows up because you finally call out to him. This is what we do. But look at this in verse 49 and 50. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. A couple things. You know, I was reading a commentary and then I heard a pastor talking about this in the first century. And earlier than that and even after that, they had a legend that if you were out to sea and you are getting ready to die, that an apparition, a ghost, would come to greet you. And so understand what's going on here. These guys, they think they're about to die again out on the water, and they see a ghost, quote-unquote, coming at them. So they panic. But we also read in, in the Gospel of John that they cried out to him that they welcomed him into the boat. They willingly received Jesus into the boat. And I love that, but I also love this. Jesus says, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. He would say that to every one of us. Don't be afraid. But also notice this, where it says, it is I, ego of me. That's the I am statement. You know, this is one of the most beautiful and amazing things for every one of us as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, of, of Yeshua. He is the I am. He is the creator of the universe. He controls all nature. He controls all things. He has eternity already written. You can trust him. Call out to him and trust him. Be of good cheer. But I love that. And we know there's more to the story here. I won't go into all that, but um, I think it's, it's great because in Mark we don't see how Peter, remember in another gospel we read Matthew, Peter gets out of the boat and actually walks on water. You know, the only other man besides Jesus to walk on water that wasn't frozen. He walked on the waves, he walked on the water just like Jesus. But remember, in the introduction to Mark, I told you who the, the, uh, the person who actually... Um, inspired this gospel. Of course, it was the Holy Spirit, but it was Peter. This is Peter's account of the gospel. And I think this is beautiful because when we're talking about the spiritual and the natural working together, that's the Holy Bible. Do you understand? God chose to use over 40 different men to pen the Bible on three different continents over a span of 1,500 plus years. And yet it never contradicts, despite what people try to say. It's the most tested book in history. Go test it. The thing is, is it's a beautiful uh, combination of the natural. He used the men who wrote these gospels, who wrote these books. He used them and their flaws and their weaknesses and he, it, with this beautiful spiritual perfection. And I think here, Peter, who's given this account to Mark, leaves out the fact that he walked on water because it's showing us even more that Peter's been humbled. It's no mention in this gospel, which Peter is the source. But know this... <laughs> Um, I love this because, you know, Jesus immediately talked to them. He calmed them down. He didn't want them to freak out. And I'm telling you, this is what's so important about the Word of God. You know, sometimes we're in a situation and we're freaking out. Or, again, have you ever been there? And we're freaking out. Maybe you're freaking out. This sermon's going long, buddy. We got food to eat. I get it. Just hold on. But here's the thing. You're freaking out and you're praying and you're not getting an answer. Open the Bible. When you understand what the Word of God really is, when you understand what the Bible really is, God's Word is right before you at all times. Why do we neglect it? I mean, how many of you, and I don't want to see hands, how many of you didn't even read your Bible this week? It's God's Word. It will change you from the inside out. But I love the fact that Jesus is going to do another incredible miracle here in verse 51. Then he went up into the boat, and the wind ceased, and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled. What I love, though, is that sometimes we miss this. In John chapter 6, verse 21, it tells us that an even greater miracle happened than just the wind. Now, the wind calming is a huge miracle. Jesus proves he's Lord over all creation. But John 6, 21 says this, Then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. Do you understand they'd been pushed four miles out to sea? Understand what just happened. Jesus got in the boat, and it immediately was at the shoreline. Do you, do you see that? 
This is an amazing miracle. It reminds me of Philip. Remember when Philip was preaching to the Ethiopian eunuch? Do you, do you guys remember that story? Or do I have to go into that too? I'll ma don't make me stay here two hours. <laughs> So Philip, is, is, he's told by the Lord, run up next to this Ethiopian eunuch who's reading the scriptures, reading the Isaiah scroll, in his, and he's a very powerful man, and he's in his chariot. And Philip says, hey, do you know what you're reading? He says, how do well I know unless somebody teach me? So Philip gets up there, teaches him what the Bible is saying about Jesus in Isaiah. The Ethiopian eunuch says, I want to be saved, and I want to be baptized. And Philip says, okay, there's water. I'm going to baptize you. What happens? Philip takes him, baptizes him, and the scripture tells, us, tells you and me, that Philip is then immediately transported 19 miles away to another city. Boom! Mini rapture. <laughs> you know, when I look at this and I see these guys in their boat, I, and they're transported immediately four miles to the shoreline, all I do is think about our boat that's going to be transported soon. You know, our king is coming. The Lord is coming for his church. Are you in the boat? See, it breaks my heart because there are going to be a lot of people who miss out. I think churches are going to be full the Sunday after the rapture, unfortunately. Many people are going to miss out. And I told you before, a lot of people are going to miss heaven by 18 inches. The difference between the brain and the heart. Don't be left out. Know your faith. Know that it's true faith. And know the king that saved you. He's coming for us. And one day soon, our boats are going to be transported. I cannot wait. And here's the other thing. We find out why Jesus made them go through this lesson again. Have you ever, uh, again, I know it's just me, but I do this just for the benefit of, you know, openness. Um, have you ever gone through a lesson over and over because you just won't learn it? Has God ever taken you back through the same lesson over and over? Okay. He's certainly done that with me. He's doing that with the apostles here. And we find out why in verse 52. And this, by the way, is usually why we have to go back through those same lessons. For they had not understood about the loaves, because their heart, their heart was hardened. After everything they'd seen, after everything they'd experienced, after everything they'd done and been with Jesus, their hearts were still hard. Can that be said about any of us? Are we so consumed with the physical, with the carnal, that we ignore the spiritual, and we forget all the lessons that Jesus teaches us? We forget about his power and who he really is. You know, to their credit, they weren't filled with the Holy Spirit. That hadn't come yet. But that's even more challenging for us because we are. And we can be guilty of this same exact thing. But this is what I love. And I'm about done, I promise. Jesus is going to get them right back on the horse. He's going to get them right back into ministry. He teaches them a tough lesson, tough love. But then he's going to get them right back serving. And this is a lesson, and don't miss this because I promise I'm almost done. Don't miss this. You know, too many times in ministry what I see is I see people who cause problems wherever they go. I see people, no matter what situation they're in, it's the same problems. They have the same problem with this person or that person, just a different person wherever they're at. You know, it's kind of like that old saying, I'm not crazy, it's all of you, <laughs> you know. I've seen people in the church and ministry no matter where they go, they have the same problem. It's always the same problem. Just ask them. Because they refuse to learn the lessons that God has for them. And I've seen people who say they want to serve the Lord until they're treated like a servant. And then their real reaction comes out. Again, if you want to know if you're a true servant of the Lord, tell me how you react when someone, someone treats you like that. Treats you like a servant. You know, a lot of times what happens is we, like the disciples, we get stuck in phase one. And we can't transition to phase two, to be a true apostle, to serve our king, to do the things we're called to do, because we're caught up in our own pride. I've seen men pout like little children. You know, the Bible tells us, be like men, be ye like men, gird yourself up like men. And yet in the church, in ministry, what I've seen is men pout. Oh, well, they didn't talk to me. Or they didn't say this. Or they said this that offended me. And I've seen them pout and whine and cry. When you're supposed to be a man of God, why are you acting like a child? And I'm not letting you ladies off the hook either. Although we're about to eat food, so I'll probably get some dumped on me. But 
You know, it's the same thing with you. What happens with ladies is you get bitterness. You get angry at somebody and then you, oh man, whew, we saw it last week. You know, remember Herodias, she held on to that grudge. She wasn't going to let it go. Ladies, you're called to forgive. You're not called to hold to a grudge or to become bitter. Men and women of God, don't act like children. What are you doing acting like kids? If we want to be effective in ministry, we got to grow up. You don't pout and whine and cry like a little baby. You don't get your little feelings hurt. Just serve your king. And now here's the other thing about that. If your feelings do get hurt, just go to the person and talk to them. Nine times out of ten, the person that's offended you doesn't have a clue they offended you. Grow up. Learn the lessons God has for you. Stop being just a disciple. Here's the problem. If a church is just full of disciples that never transition to apostles, it'll be the most miserable place on the planet. It'll be the most miserable place to be. A bunch of disciples who are consumed with self, who don't even think about others. Be apostles. That's the call of this teaching today. Go to phase two. Ask for everything you need. God will give you everything you need, and he doesn't care what you have to offer. Give him whatever you have. And I love this because he just takes his disciples, his apostles, right back onto the mission field. Verse 53, when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and anchored there. And when they came out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him, ran through the whole surrounding region, and began to carry about on beds those who were sick to wherever they heard he was. Wherever he entered into villages, cities, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him were made well. And so these disciples, these apostles, who, who just learned this hard lesson, they just get back to work, and we see that many were made well. That is a lesson for all of us. Just serve. Just serve. And I want to ask this question as we close. We're going to get ready for communion and then the potluck. But I just want to ask you this question. What glasses do you wear? What glasses are you wearing? Is everything carnal, physical, literal to you? Or are you looking at things through spiritual lenses? Are you looking at things through the eyes that Jesus wants you to have? Is your Christian ministry, is your Christian walk private, personal? There's an aspect of that, but it's to be public, here to serve others. That's what we're called to do. You are a disciple. Have you graduated to apostleship? <laughs> Have you graduated to phase two? Those are just some things to consider as we get ready for communion. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word, and thank you for the lessons it has. God, fill us. Fill us, Lord, because we lack. Fill us because we're leaky vessels. <laughs> Fill us because we need you. We need your eyes. We need your lenses. God, help us to be men of God and women of God, not children scattered to and fro, but God, focused on you and willing to serve our King. And Lord, as we get ready for communion, prepare our hearts and our minds and help us to let go of anything we have against anyone or anything. Help us to repent of any sin we have. And help us, Lord, to be mindful of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.